I, I could read you all eight paragraphs about Don and Carla, but I want them to have the time. I'm going to make it short. Um, Don, we know, is an active member of San Miguel. He writes for the Atencion. He presides over his homeowners association. He's a singer. He's an actor. He has an MS degree in kinesiology, an MA in theater arts. Um, He's a certified teacher of the Alexander Technique. That's what he does that's unrelated to what he's going to talk about today. He's the president of uh, Jovenes Adelantes. He's also a mentor. And um, mentorship is a big part of the program and he'll tell us all about how that works. Um, he is accompanied today by Vicencia Carla Maria Cadena Rio. He was a, a Jovenes Adelante student between 2014 and 2018. And she's been a project assistant to Midday Rotary Club since 2016. And she's also the administrative director of Mirigare Cuidados Paliativos, uh, which is a hospital organization. She's uh, got a, a practical theoretical diploma in groundwater by the Center of Geosciences of the Universidad Autónoma de México. And she got a degree in business administration with a final average of 9.5 from the Universidad Autónoma de Querétaro. So we've got a very impressive a duo here today to tell us about Jovenes Adelante. And with that, it's all yours, Don. Great, thank you, Chris. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for joining us. And, and Chris, thank you for inviting Jovenes Adelante and, and me and Carla to um, have the opportunity to do this presentation for you. Most of you probably have some familiarity with Jovenes Adelante. And I'm just gonna make a quick stop here and just check that everyone can see the screen, that everyone can see me somewhere if they want to and everyone can hear me. We're good? Yes. All right, terrific. Jovenes Adelante was founded in, in 2001. We're really celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. It's gone through stages of growth over the years. And I always, I always like to, to, to say what Jovenes Adelante actually means in English, it means youth moving or going forward or youth moving ahead. And that's really the, the fundamentally the mission of Jovenes Adelante is to help kids move ahead who are from San Miguel de Allende via principally higher education. We have a, we have a, a small pilot that's, that's going on that I won't really talk about today for high school students, but I will talk about high school. Um, all right, Ron, if you can go to the next slide. Great, thank you. The, the big picture that I wanna focus on today is the environment in which Jovenes Adelante operates, what we are seeing on the ground this year and what we're seeing across the educational spectrum in Mexico. This is all very brief. And within that, I will talk about Jovenes Adelante and how we develop and how we continue to advance our own program. If you go to the next slide, this is the really bad news in all of Mexico is that because of COVID, as everywhere in the world, really, about 9 million students across the board have dropped out of school this year. That's not university students. I can't speak to that directly. I can tell you that many of our, of our own students talk about the fact that about half of their students have dropped out this year, which obviously is a tragedy for them. It's a tragedy for their families. It's a tragedy for the local community and it's a tragedy for the country. And we can only hope that those kids will find a way to go back to school at some point. Um, the data that we have on re-entry into school in Mexico is not strong. So it's really, really important that kids stay in school. The one exception are, 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 are single mothers who, who sometimes will come back after they've, after they've 
had a kid and sometimes they even stay in school if they have had a kid. Next slide, please. This is a summary of what happens in high school to give you a context of what we're dealing with in San Miguel de Allende. In, this, in the 2016-2019 cycle, according to the Secretary of Education of Guanajuato, there were a little over 3,300 kids who graduated from secundaria. By the time they get through the, get to being college age eligible, 58% of those students has dropped out. So only 42% succeed. And what I can tell you nationally, if we can go to the next slide, thank you. Uh, actually, what I can tell you for San Miguel de Allende is that of those who then do go on to university, only 26% make it through. So that's the context in which we're operating. It's higher across Mexico. In Mexico City, it's actually closer to 85 to 90%. And in all of Mexico, it's probably at an average now, it's going up um, of about 35%. But in the state of Guanajuato and in San Miguel de Allende, we're still talking about really only 26% of kids who start university get through it. That's why when you look over at the left, at our graduation rate of approximately 85%, that's dramatic. And we're not the educating institute. So the question is, what are we doing that leads to a better success rate of graduating students? If we can go to the next slide, every time a kid drops out of school, there's an opportunity cost. Right, they may, they may need to stay um, engaged with the family. Students may need to go to work right away coming out of high school or drop out of university at the end of the first year to go earn money. But that's opportunity cost that's lost in the long term to the student. I will say it once, I will say it a thousand times. The most critical thing that any country in the world can do long-term for the health of its population is education. And we know that in every country in the world. Are there any questions about whatever I've introduced so far? All right. This is some recent, fairly recent data from the Organization of Economic Development that just shows that things are improving in Mexico from 2008 to 2018, there is an increase of third level of university education from 16 to 23% of the population. We know that the Mexican government is beginning to start to invest more in higher education. The emphasis is still on secundaria and prepa. Um, prepa is high school and it's three years here locally in San Miguel. We know that Mexico enjoys the second highest earnings premium over those with only a high school education of all of the countries in, uh, that are studied by the Organization of Economic Development. And you can see these other stats, you can read them for, yourself, for yourselves. I wanna talk a little bit, I wanna go back to number one of the Rotary Test of Four. For me, we can talk about what is truth, and I would argue that ultimately truth has some level of subjectivity to it. But what really matters is how we determine what the truth is from my point of view. And there are several ways of knowing. One way of knowing is empirical study. So the scientific method in all of its various forms is an empirical way of noting, knowing. Another way of knowing is our own personal experience and what we observe. So that tends to get called anecdotal data. Another way of knowing is relying on some other source, some influencer that we trust. And as an extension of that, we also have belief as a way of knowing. And specifically speaking, if we talk about religious belief, that's a context when people are putting faith and confidence in whatever their religious 
um, frame of reference is as what guides them for truth. So it's really, really common in the nonprofit world to get very fixed on the picture that you see when you form the organization and to stay very focused on the mission that you created, the way you go about doing things and not continuing to question. And if there's one thing I want you to go away with today, it's that at Jóvenes Adelante, we are constantly looking and evaluating at what we're doing well, how we define what we're doing well, what we're not doing well, and what is the, what is the community that we serve telling us? And we serve two communities. Obviously, we serve the student population and family population of San Miguel de Allende in about 39 different communities, and we serve our donors. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the way that we achieve, or at least the way we think we achieve the results that we uh, have with, our, with respect to our graduation and success rate starts at the bottom of this pyramid. It, obviously we provide money. That's what brings our kids to us. We do not provide small amounts of money, relatively speaking. We provide a premium scholarship that is about eight. The student receives about $1,250 a year plus a computer in their first year, plus after they have finished their coursework and their professional internship, we then pay for their professional credentialing, which is up at the almost to the top of this um, pyramid. That's something that's relatively new. Two or three years ago, we noticed we had too many graduates who were not actually moving into the fields they wanted at the pay scale that they deserve earning that premium because the process of getting a professional certification for every career, a licenciatura, is high. It's not only financially costly, but also can take up to two years to negotiate getting it done. We start with funding, of course, and we also have found over the years that mentors are critical to the process. I'll talk more about mentors later, but by a mentor, what we mean is someone who is really hand in hand working with that student, whether that's once a week or once a month, or just a WhatsApp call or a video call, somebody that that student knows that they can always call on and meet with once a month to support them. Not financially, but support them emotionally, psychologically, vet problems, help them problem solve, encouragement, guide them. And those mentors then provide information to Jóvenes Adelante directly, to the rest of Jóvenes Adelante, so that if more intervention is needed uh, to help support a kid, we can provide that. The next step often shows up in, in a counselor. These students do not have an easy time, right? It is hard. Any, all, of, all of you who know what it's like to go to college in the US or in Canada, you know that difficult transition, magnify it tenfold, for a typical Mexican family, especially a Mexican family in San Miguel Allende, where there's a very low level of education in the family as a whole. We also provide success skills programming, and I'm gonna talk a bit more about that down the, down the road. But what we consider success skills has changed over time. We used to, we used to refer to leadership skills, we used to talk we used to refer to English exclusively at different times. What we're now beginning to do is actually look at exit data from graduates across the university spectrum in Mexico and find out what they are reporting to empirical scientists and to the, and what our employers reporting as those skills that they're missing when they graduate from university. So that A, we can make sure that 
to the extent we have the capacity, we can give at least a foundation for what these kids are gonna need later and what can we provide to the kids to make sure that they get through and we hit anywhere above that 26% graduation rate, but obviously we wanna stay in the, in the 80 to 85% graduation rate. When all of that's done, we also have a, when, all, when the student actually graduates, they also have a graduate network. Um, Carla is a member, for example, of that graduate network. We are trying to build the equivalent of an, of an alumni association within all of our kids. That way the family, the, the dynamic of being the beneficiary of the organization and then being able to share professional experience and come back as a mentor, as Carla is, or just as someone who makes a presentation, someone to help find a job, provide information, these are all really critical. Let's move on to the next slide, thank you. So despite the catastrophe of COVID in Mexico with those 9 million people um, dropping out of school, at Jóvenes Adelante locally, we have seen twice in the last three years now, a doubling of the number of applications to our program. In 2018 and 2019, you can see we were averaging about 135 students in 2000 uh, applicants. In 2020, we had 267 applicants. And this year, we had 557 applicants. So that is telling us that the demand, the desire for higher education is actually, is it either increasing or it's always been high and we're doing a better job of reaching people. And it's probably something in between. And COVID may be a factor because people are having a harder time finding work. So perhaps they are looking to extend their educational opportunity and their ultimate employment opportunity by getting a higher education. That's anecdotal and observational. I don't have concrete data. It's too early to know on that subject. What's exciting for us is that we have 50, 557 applicants this year. We had 500 plus people on a Facebook call just sitting through our application process. Okay, let's go to the next slide. I do get a lot of questions um, and there are a lot of assumptions about who our population is of students. Most people still have a preconception that most of the students um, in Mexico are male and increasingly that's changing. And what we can see ourselves is that the statistics of the applicants consistently now, we're seeing two thirds female and one third male in our applicants. We're probably at about 45, 55 in terms of our overall cohort of students. We have 105 to 107 students, one or two just graduated, so I'm not, I don't have the most current number. Um, but the notion that women are, that women are staying home and, and being asked to continue with family or, or, or work at home in the house, that's clearly changing. Let's go on to the next slide, please. Most of our, two thirds also of our applicants our university applicants. We take students, as a rule, we only take students for a minimum of three years. We want to have that exposure with that student and for that student to have the exposure to what we provide for a minimum of three years on average. There are a couple of exceptions. They're not important for today. So most of our student applicants are applying in the middle or towards the end of their first year of university looking for support to continue through. Ideally, by virtue of our model and our history, we actually are looking for the reverse of that. So we try to balance it out a bit when we actually do the selection of our students um, in the sense that we try to take a little bit heavier weight of first year, uh, students who are just graduating high school and going into that first year. Having said that, in the COVID environment, we've learned that we will probably not rigorously enforce that this year. 
because in fact, kids who've already been in university for one year of telecommuting to school, they're likely to actually do better and have a better sense of adjustment than kids coming right out of high school. Next slide, please. This year, and this is the first year we've done this deliberately, we are only accepting applicants who are in the first generation in their family to go to university. So that means if, that means if the parents, if one of the parents is professional and went to university, we did not, we did not continue with the application process for those students this year. If they have a sibling in the same generation, that's fine. We made this as a strategic decision when we were looking at overall impact of higher education in Mexico. And just like everywhere else in the world, we see that socioeconomic mobility is really pivots and hangs on education. And Mexico has one of the most intractable, difficult to crack contexts for advancement, socioeconomic advancement of any country in the world. So we decided to focus on first generation students and we've been very pleased so far. We're extremely pleased with the results. We'll have to see next year whether we choose to make any exceptions on that. I wanna give you a next slide, please. I wanna give you a little bit of a, of a sneak preview. These are applicants, these are not students, but these are the, the in blue, are the fields of study that we saw predominantly in 2020 and in whatever other color that is, because I'm colorblind in that spectrum, um, <laughs> we can see what we're seeing in 2021. We're seeing fewer engineering student applicants this year, more medical, about the same in architecture. Notice the big drop in in students who are looking to go into the tourist industry. That's, we expect a reflection of COVID and the, and the, and the, and the impact on the community um, and on the families of the communities that tend to work in the, in the tourist industry. These are not hard numbers. There's a little bit of slough. There are certainly kids who might be going into business management or went into business management in one school, but in another school, it's, it's called tourism. So I can't be really, really specific with this data at this time. All right, let's move on to the next slide. So we do have a graduate network and I'm gonna introduce Carla Cadena in a second. Carla represents two things, our graduate network and our mentors. You can go to the next slide. Next. So again, I did talk about mentors and I'll talk about mentors a little bit more specifically after Carla talks, but Carla, why don't you talk about yourself and your own experience? You are one of our stars. And as I said, you've come back to be a mentor and as an active member of our graduate network. Perfect. So if we go to the next slide, please. First of all, I want to say thank you to Midday Rotary Club for allowing us to be in this space and Jóvenes Adelante for inviting me to join the presentation. So today I want to share with you a little of what is being part of Jóvenes Adelante. Uh, I applied for the scholarship in 2014. It was like a different scenario. Fortunately, I was one of the students chosen. I remember there were about 100 applications for that time. And then, uh, sorry, I, I will fix the audio. Uh, so I was one of 100 applications and only one of the 10, or around 10 students chosen. It is important to say that Jóvenes Adelante do not give a scholarship unless they have the funds complete. So students will not be in risk that having not enough funds like in the middle of their career. Uh, it was something really new for me, like a new, uh, let's say, a new experience because I was the first student in my family going to university. 
My father only finished primary. My mom only finished, um, as we say, open secondary. She was studying when she was uh, like around 20 years. So um, this was something new for me. I didn't knew like what to do, but I needed to find like the, the steps to follow. So this was from a family of 50% coming from rural community and then 50% from urban area. So we needed to find like how to do it, no? And my family were try and I were trying to find like other sources to support uh, this dream that I had. So we needed to find like other other alternatives, other options, and then we found Jóvenes Adelante. They have always uh, thought of like how to win our own money and how to take the the real value of how work is. So since very children, my brother and I were learning how to uh, dog walking, house sitting, selling cookies, cakes, bracelets, killing cushions made my, by my family, etc. So since very children, they have thought of all that part of their real life. Uh, as they say, my parents, uh, we're not going to leave you something material, but we will give you uh, values that will last like as long as you keep them. No? So the way that they support us the most is by giving us like skills and alternatives to strength things in life and encouraging us every day to keep uh, trying to achieve our goals. Then when I graduated after four years and a half of, of studying, um, Midday Rotary Club and Lee Carter allowed me to be part of Rotary uh, as an intern. So it was supporting the, the activities of the projects that they have, like water harvesting, dry toilets, and etc. cetera. Uh, after I graduated in 2018, I was hired by Hospice Care by Mitigare. Um, now I'm the director of administration of that NGO, so I keep working in both NGOs here in San Miguel de Allende. About the support that Jóvenes Adelante gives, I can say it is something very amazing, it is wonderful, because they don't only provide you financially uh, support, they also help you, as Don said, they provide you a computer to support the studies, the tests, etc., that we need to do for university. They also support us psychologically in case that we have a problem or if there is something like lacking our development or our skills by school or in family. They also provide us several supports during all the career where we are able to learn more and share time with all the other um, students that have the scholarship. And also they recently started supporting uh, the process of getting the final papers, like the title that we need to get like at the end of our careers. The staff is always spending on us. They are always like taking care of what else do we need if we're having a problem. They are always encouraging us. They show us their affection. So at the end, they create a big family. And we can see in those pictures uh, all of us show like a happy face because it's very good for us to see each other once in a while and it's very fun and every time that in my experience every time I see all the family uh, it fills me again with all energy so I have like double of energy to continue achieving my goals. Then um, also every student has a mentor for us to be able to have like a more close person to talk with, like to give us guide, motivation, to talk about what we're uh, achieving, what we're going to, like for example, in the family, in the school, with a friend, with the test, with the teachers, etc. In my case, my mentor Paula, which is in the third picture, um, she became a friend of me. So I had like enough confidence. Fortunately, I keep my mentor all the career. Some of the students where they are having a problem, they need to switch into another mentor. But in my case, Paula was my mentor during all the career. Uh, it is very good to have someone that is listening to you, that will give you motivation or will guide you up according to their experience. Like 
yes, do it, or I recommend you to, to change to another option, no? for example. So in this case, Paula inspired me so much. And then my dream after graduating was like to become a mentor. And then I said, maybe when I have like more experience, I can, I can do that activity. <laughs> then I realized that there were two years after graduation and Joven Adelante uh, made me the, the invitation to do it and I say, well, why not? Maybe it's time to you know when sometimes when you don't take your own decision, there is something that pushes you to do it. So it's important also to take the risk. So uh, today I can say that it's almost half of a year that I have my first student uh, to mentor and I'm really enjoying this way. And I really hope that I'm doing like the best that, that Jovenes Adelante is expecting. So that's what I can say about a brief of my experience of being part of the family of Jovenes Adelante. Great, thank you, Carla. You're welcome. All right, Ron, if you can go back to the, go on to the next screen. Great, so we, we've just had a question of how do you become a mentor? Um, which, is a, which is a terrific question. Obviously in Carla's case, uh, we asked her because she's so wonderful and we thought that it would be so great to have a, a graduate and another graduate coming back um, to be a mentor. Our mentors are both Mexican and Canadians or Americans for the most part. Um, we, we, we have a mentor who lives in Spain uh, so our mentors, have, we're looking to match, ideally, someone who has enough Spanish, who can have a conversation and communicate and be of support for the student, and who has some kind of professional background that is congruent with whatever the student is studying. Sometimes that doesn't happen. We can't always achieve it. We have 107 students. That means a lot of mentors. I believe we currently have 96 mentors. And as you'll see on the next slide, each of those mentors are, are providing reports. And this is how we're doing monthly. If we can, if we can keep our, our, our mentors filing reports at about the same rate as our graduation rate, we're happy, we're doing, we're doing really well. And we have some great mentors who, are, who have some um, technological challenges. So we, you know, we do whatever it is that we can to help the mentors get on with this. We just go to the next slide. But basically to become a mentor, what you would do is you can write to me because it's convenient right now or to our mentor director, Nora Weaver. And you can also contact the staff. We have a, we have a staff mentor coordinator as well who can, who can help. And we can, we can certainly circulate all that contact information later. Um, I just wanna talk very briefly about these Two most recent additions to the program, professional credentials we've already talked about. They are really, really critical. Um, the other is English. We've always had an English requirement in Jovenes Adelante, but we've never really had, a, had a, a scalable, manageable way of supporting our kids with English that doesn't either overwhelm the organization or overwhelm the students. But we know that it's critical. We now have for the first time on the board a English as a foreign language tutor uh, who is also assembling other tutors. So essentially we're taking the mentor program, we're adapting it to other volunteers who are, who are being oriented to how to work with our students with English at the level that the student needs for their own professional development. So if a student needs to qualify for their professional licensure, for example, at the Instituto San Miguelente, if they need to have a TOEFL exam, then we'll find them a tutor who's familiar with the TOEFL exam. And the student and the, and the tutor make a three-month commitment to each other to meet. And then, and then this program is evolving, and so we'll continue to see how it develops. Um, next slide is just a picture of our 2020 incoming class. And that's really the end of my, of, of my visual presentation. And Carla and I are happy to take more questions now. 
All right. If anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, uh, put it in the chat box. You'll find that at the bottom of your screen. Uh, or otherwise, uh, just um, raise your hand and I will do my best to uh, see if we can. Uh, anybody out there? So Nora um, just posted, Nora Weaver just posted her, her email address. Um, right. or, maybe, or, or maybe it was someone else. I'm not quite sure who posted that. Uh, oh, probably Nori. It was me. It was me. It was Nori. Nori. Oh, thank, thank yeah. you, Nori. Um, my pleasure. Okay. Nora, oh my God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> too, too difficult in one day. We have, as I said, we have, a, we have about 105 to 107 students currently. They, we have 96 mentors, I believe. But we have a waiting list now of mentors. Uh, this year, I think Nora has about 45 or 50 candidates who want to be mentors. And we will be taking in, we have, we will hopefully be taking in 33 new students this year. Wow. All right. Uh, if uh, anyone is interested, it's in the chat, by, uh, chat box to mentor, uh, contact Nora.Weaver at gmail.com. Don, we have uh, another question from Tom Schneider. What's the financial commitment for a sponsor? The financial commitment for a sponsor is a five-year commitment and that of $1,800 US a year or $9,000 over the five years. How that's paid is completely up to the donor. The reason that we ask for that financial commitment is because unlike many scholarship programs, we really do make the commitment to the student for the full course of their university study, as well as their professional uh, internship and their professional credentialing. Now, obviously the student has a contractual obligation to maintain grades. They, there's academic probation processes. They have contractual responsibility to meet um, with their mentor, they have classes they need to attend, etc. Okay, very good. Uh, it's important to note that there is a difference between the sponsor and a mentor. I don't yes. think there's a financial commitment for a mentor. Right. No. That's that's correct. Sponsor is the is the is the is the fine is the is the money. Mentor is the emotional support. However, very, however, yeah. we do. Now, at this time at Jóvenes Adelante, we actively encourage our students and our sponsors to meet and to connect with each other. Um, and many of our, many, many of our, uh, as long as the relationship with the, with the mentor has been established. Uh, Tom Schneider is asking about Canadian tax receipts. We are a project of MSF Canada. So the answer to the question of a Canadian tax receipt is yes. Yes. Uh, you would ultimately make the donation to Amistad Canada, specifying Jóvenes Adelante as the recipient. Don, I want to thank you for joining us today. It was very, very informative. I know that you guys are doing just an amazing job. And to show our appreciation uh, for your appearance here today, we have something for you right now. It's a certificate of appreciation. And uh, uh, Ryan's, Ryan's going to put it up here. Uh, Presented to you for your presentation to our club. Uh, Carla, you're also going to get one too. A donation of 10 polio immunizations will be made in your honor uh, to the End Polio Now campaign. And we will email those certificates of appreciation to both of you. And thank you for joining us today. Oh, that's really, really nice. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. And that concludes our meeting for today right on time. Thank you all for coming here. And uh, immediately after this meeting, we'll have a, a brief uh, uh, assembly of our uh, club services committee. Uh, but right now, we'll uh, uh, adjourn this meeting and see you all next week. This meeting's adjourned.